All right, so uh, let's finish up this relative motion here. All right, so what we're looking at is a car traveling, or two cars actually. We're in the car on the ramp, and it's coming around on this uh, circular ramp. We got the radius and the angle for the car, and it's looking over at this other car going down the highway. So uh, we want to um, get the uh, velocity of A with respect to us at B. So that's what we're trying to do here. Um, what we just did there was we found the angle of the car at B. A is going in the Y direction straight north, but uh, B is on that ramp. So what we did there was we um, found the tangential <laughs> velocity, which is perpendicular to the radius, filled in this radius angle down here, which is uh, 53. I mean, these two angles match because they're parallel angles. And then we know we had a right angle in there, so 90 minus 53 gets us 37, which is the angle of B. Okay. Now, when you're doing this uh, relative motion stuff, you vectorize things is what you do. So we've got the velocity of B going up left at 37 degrees. So just like you would with a force, you just use sine and cosine to get that into X and Y components. Okay. So, uh, so that would be the next thing to do, would be to get that velocity into x and y components. So why don't you just get these vector terms set up there for a and b. Let's take a minute and see if I'm doing that. We're doing okay on that vector stuff. So we got 0i plus 25j, that would be Va, and then minus 20 cosine 37i plus 20 sine 37j. 
just based on the angle of uh, VB. We're doing all right with that. Any, any questions on that bit? Just just like force vectors, you handle it the same way. And you know, we'll be doing some of this over the course of the term is taking forces and resolving them into components just as you would force it, or excuse me, taking velocities and accelerations and resolving them into components just like you do forces. It's the same idea. Okay. All right. All right, now once you've got that, uh, you put everything into that VA, which is 0i plus 25j, equals VB, which is minus 16i plus 12j. And then you've got unknowns for the i and j components of the relative velocity, VA with respect to B. So we got an x component and a y component. All right, now keep in mind what that is. That's really two equations wrapped into one because there's an x equation and a y equation. So what you can do then is pull out the separate equations to solve for what you want to solve for. All right, so if you want to look at the x component of the relative velocity, what you do is you pull out the x components of the equation. So you're going to get 0 is minus 16 plus VABx. So VABx is 16. <clears throat> And then uh, do the same thing for uh, VABY. So we got 25 is 12 plus VABY. So you get VA with respect to BX is 16, and VA with respect to BY is 13. Okay. So that's what we do with that. So what that's telling us is what A is doing with respect to B. So if you're, you know, next time you're in a merging car, if you're not driving, I guess, because you want to be paying attention to what you're doing if you're driving. But, you know, if you're in one of these cars, have a look at another one coming, coming across. You'll see it tends to move with respect to you. From your perspective, it it's, it's, has a, a, its own motion. Okay. And... What we've just done is mathematically describe what that motion would be. So it's 16i plus 13j. Right. So we got any questions on that bit? Okay. All right. Now that's a vector like any other, so you can take this square root of some of the squares and get the relative velocity, and as a magnitude, it's 20.6. You can then do an arctan of the uh, y component over the x component and get the angle, 39.1. So from the perspective of B, A is not going due north. See? The absolute velocity of A is going due north, but from the perspective of B, V A, A is going uh, 20.6 meters per second at an angle of 39.1 degrees. That's what it appears to be doing from the perspective of B. Okay. So we good with that? Okay. All right, so, so that's a bit of relative velocity there. Let's see what we got here. All right, so um, you know, I've got a little bit of a model here. Again, this is just kind of a can't play, we can't find an audio device, send feedback. Okay, close. Yeah, and plus it's on YouTube, then you can just give us the YouTube link if you the, the web address or, or mm -hmm. what the type in to the search engine. 
No, it's not. The thing is, it's not on YouTube. It, um, oh. And the other thing is, I got the dang thing to play the other day. I don't know. I think this doesn't like me. I don't, so I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's just a video. It's just a, I think it's a W, whatever, WV or whatever the heck, WAV. Or I, I can't remember what this stupid thing is, but it doesn't want to open. I don't know why. Open with, what are my options here? How about Windows Media? Does that do, does Windows Media Player do video? Yes. It does. Yeah. Okay, let's try that. Will that possibly work? Oh, maybe. That just might work. Okay, I've got a different one here, I'm afraid. They're, they're going different directions. But, um, so there are two objects moving. Okay, so this one obviously going the X direction. This other one going down and to the right. And then what I did on the next video here for that was to set the perspective on one of the objects. Okay, I, I'm afraid I don't have the one that we're working on right here, but... Here's an example of that with this. Oh, darn it. Yeah, I know. I screwed up. First time in my life I screwed up here. Let's see what we got. Actually, oh. second time. Maybe the third. Fourth? No, not the sixth, is it? Oh, my goodness. Seventh? Maybe. I don't know. I've forgotten. I've lost count. That's the honest truth. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Abort. Abort. Yeah, well, if you want to throw this computer out the window, I'm not blaming you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's me. It's probably not that computer. I just want to get out of this program without doing too much to have to do it. I guess I'll just do it this way. Task menu. Let's close that. Can I do that? Can I do this real quick and open with that? All right, so keep in mind... Uh, the reference frame is set on this animation to view the motion of the object on the right. So I put the reference plane on this point on now. Left. So what's, uh, well there is, okay, so that's what happens from the perspective of this object. If you remember when we had it uh, going for the first time, that was going to the right, this was going, what was it doing, was it down right? Yeah. Okay. But if you set the reference plane on this point, what happens? The reference is from the frame point is of view set of this on this one, animation if it to still, view the motion of the object of on the right, right with respect to the object on the left. This object will move differently. Okay, that's a relative motion that I'm showing there because I've got the reference point set on this point. Okay, so that's the idea. There is you can talk about absolute motion that we see, um, you know, in the first video versus relative motion from the second. And they're different things. The absolute motion is what you would see if you were just, you know, in a stationary hot air balloon or something looking down at this. That's what you would see, okay? But if you're in the top object looking at the one below, it appears to be moving differently with respect to you. And that's the idea, okay? The reference frame is set okay. on this animation to view the motion of the object on the right with respect to the object on the left. All right, just a couple others that involve relative motion. We'll come back to these, but um, I don't know. let's just have a look real quick. Open with. So this program, you can do a good bit more than just, uh, you know, put little moving objects. There's an internal combustion engine, okay? And what's going on there is you've got a piston moving up and down while the crankshaft spins. And then you've got the connecting rods in between, or the connecting rod in between, okay? So, you know, that came with the program there. So that's an internal combustion engine. That's basically how your car works. Unless you've got a very old Mazda, I think. Other than that, that's basically how they work. I don't think any of those old Mazdas are running them. Yeah, right, the Wankel. Yeah. I guess those things kind of locked up sometimes, didn't they? Okay, now let's see what we got here next. Um, let's, uh, let's see how I would make an internal combustion engine. Not quite having the skill of these people that wrote the program. Here's mine. Okay. And you get the idea, okay? Nice and slow. 
So what you got there is the crankshaft at the bottom, the connecting rod with the line, and then the piston moving up and down. Now, what if we set our frame of motion here at the bottom of the connecting rod as it goes around? What would the piston be doing with respect to the bottom of the connecting rod? Uh, nothing. No, it'll be doing something. Because see that connecting rod, as you watch it, kind of goes back and forth, doesn't it, as it swings around the, the crankshaft? So there is kind of an angular, well, it's going to be hard for me to do, but there is kind of an angular motion, okay? That's one thing you've got is an angular motion back and forth. Now, the other thing you've got is a connecting rod. And a connecting rod is a certain length, isn't it? Whatever that happens to be. Mm -hmm. So what you've got is the piston moves angularly with respect to the end of the connecting rod, and it's always a certain length away. So if you put those two facts together, what do you get for the motion of the piston with respect to the connecting rod? Back and forth, side to side, but always a certain distance away, a given distance away. So what's that going to be? Yeah, it is. And if you go back and forth at a set distance, you are describing a... Not quite, because that's not quite... The relative distance. motion right taken idea. about the bottom so of the connecting rod. So this is relative motion taken about the, the bottom of the connecting rod. Okay. So that's the relative motion there. It's a rotation, because you've got angular deformation, but because that connecting rod is solid and doesn't break, the piston is always a certain distance away from the end of the connecting rod. Relative motion taken so about from the bottom of the, of the connecting, connecting rod, rod where it connects to the crankshaft. It appears to be rotating, that's what it appears to be doing. Okay. So that's kind of odd, but that's, that's how that one goes. We'll come back to that. Yeah. All right, why don't we take this another step here and let's get into some acceleration with this one. So let's say we've got these accelerations. So the uh, car B is doing what a lot of people do when they merge. They're just stepping on the gas. So they're accelerating down along the ramp. So 2.1 meter per second squared acceleration. The speed of car B is increasing. And car A is looking at car B and not quite sure what to do. So the car A is slowing down, has a negative acceleration south there at point 0.9. Okay, we have the velocities of the cars from the last uh, problem there. And uh, let's find the acceleration of A with respect to B. So if you're in B and you're looking at A, how does it, what, what's the acceleration of it with respect to you? Okay. So if we want the acceleration of A with respect to B, let's get that written down. What's the letters for that? If you're going to have the acceleration of A with respect to B. Okay. We need an A. And you put them down in the order you read them. A with respect to B. And it's a vector, so you put a vector hat on it, okay? And then, are we good with that? That's how you write that. And then, how would you put that into an equation? Because we've got a sub a, we got a sub b. How would we put those three things together into an equation that makes sense? Yeah, what we want to do, we want to get those subscripts to work out kind of algebraically when we multiply them together. That's how I think about it. So I got to involve this like that. Now I want to get rid of the, the denominator, the bottom of the fraction. So I'll put a sub b here. And when, so when I add those two together, that what will happen. In my mind, this is just a, 
device to remember it. That's really all this is. What I'm saying doesn't really mean anything. It's just a way to remember it. If I multiply those two fractions together, I'll get A. So that's what goes over here. Okay. It's just how I remember how to. I, sometimes I get a little confused how to set up the equations. So this is how I remember how to do it. It's just a way to remember it. Okay. So that's the equation I want to work with. So just like before, if I get acceleration of A and acceleration of B, I can find the acceleration of A with respect to B. Okay. So I'm going to work with A sub A equals A sub B plus A with A sub A with respect to B. Okay. All right, so what's a sub a then? What, how would you express that as a vector? Because when you do this relative velocity and relative acceleration stuff, you do it with vectors. So what do we got for a sub a? Yeah, we got, so on that one, we're going to have a sub a, or excuse me, we're going to have zero i, because it doesn't move in the x direction. And then we're going to have minus 0.9j. Right. That's what a sub a is, okay, just... Because it's given, it's just going due south, accelerating due south, I should say, at point nine. Um, all right, now a sub b is a little bit trickier. You know, we're given the uh, two point one. Now, what 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 particularly is two point one? That that's how much that car is speeding up at. In our dynamics vocabulary, what would we call two point one? What is it? It's it's a uh, it's tangential, yeah, and that's the one we'd use here. So that's a tangential acceleration, because that's when your speedometer changes, when, you're, when you start speeding up, slowing down in your car. That's tangential. So we're coming around this circular ramp. So what other kind of acceleration do we got? Normal, yeah, and that's what, what is that? I guess I just bumped something here. B squared over R, right? So anytime you travel in a curve, you've got a normal acceleration in towards the center of the curve, and its magnitude is V squared over R. And that's a good thing, because we got v, v and we got R, so we can calculate that up easily enough, okay? So, you know, in the previous problem, the relative velocity problem, we have that velocity, I think it's 25. The radius is given as 120 meters. Oh, it's 20. It's not 25. It's 20. So we can take the 20. So what we got there in the tangential direction is 2.1. And I'll put a tangential unit vector on that, u sub t. That means, all that means is it's pointing in the tangential direction. And then I got v squared over r. The velocity is 20. The radius is 120, that's in the normal direction. Okay. So what I'm doing there, I'm using normal tangential coordinates. They're pretty easy to use for this kind of motion because you know the tangential direction is just the way the thing's moving, and the normal direction is normal to that in towards the center of the curve. So wherever the heck the thing's at, I just got normal and tangential axes. That's that's about it, okay? But if I want to do this relative acceleration, I got to get this into um, x and y coordinates, okay? So if I want to get kind of fancy in how I express it, I got to transform the normal tangential coordinates to the x-y coordinate system is what I got to do, which really means I'm just going to do some trigonometry here is really about all it means, but, but that's what I got to do, okay? I got to convert the normal tangential coordinate system that I've got and convert it over to x and y. And see, I've got the angle that the thing's at. It's at 53 right now. Okay. So I can do that. 
So I got 53 degrees right here. So that means that's 53 degrees. And I got the velocity doing that. So that means that's 37 degrees. And what else do I got? Oh, that's right. I've got that and I've got that. Okay. These are opposite angles. So that's 53 degrees also. Okay. So that's where I'm coming up with that sketch. And, you know, one thing I want to mention is uh, a couple of things, I guess. Um, you know, you learn a lot of stuff in school, and frankly, some of it's worth maybe a little bit more than some others. Um, one thing that is worth something is, geom is uh, geometry. You know, a lot of, especially if you're civil or mechanical or whatever, you're going to spend time laying stuff out, making sure it works and it fits together, making sure you can put the pump station in the a uh, little building that's been designed that's six feet by six feet, you know, making sure that the pipe running over here is going to intersect that pipe there, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, learn how to do good practical geometry. And, and you know, we don't want to do what I call intuitive geometry. Well, that angle's such. No, don't do that, okay? Intuition is great for writing haikus and stuff like that, but it's not great for geometry, okay? So draw a sketch, prove it to yourself. You know, remember that stuff you did when you took geometry in high school? Those proofs. I had a teacher who was mean. She uh, had a wrestler lipping off to her. She picked him up by his tablet on the tablet armchair and shook him in the air. Was the story? I don't know. So, so she kind of taught through. I don't know, she was actually a very nice, nice woman and and smart and good at what she did. But we were all kind of scared of her, you know. So, but anyway, so. Um, I, uh, so that's, you know, she, she taught me that stuff pretty well, you know, the opposite angles, right? That works, okay? But so don't just kind of pick something up and say, oh, yeah, this is such and such. Prove it, you know? Step by step, just put together a little bit of, of a sketch, just like I did there. I know that these angles are parallel, so they're the same. I know that that's a 90. So if I take 90 minus 53, I get 37. And then I know that these are opposite angles, so they're the same. You know, right? That's all stuff I learned freshman year of high school, I think. Okay. All right, so we know those angles. We've got the different uh, acceleration vectors there. We just do a little bit of trig and get those things uh, resolved into X and Y components. Okay. So that's what's happening over there on the right. Just make it into vectors, that's all. Okay. And I'm losing a little bit off my slide, but you've got it on your your copy. Like that. Okay. Alright, so we good with that. And so we just do minus cosine 37 and plus sine 37 times 2.1. It's that one. It's going to the left, so it's minus cosine 37 for the x component. It's going up, so it's sine 37 for the y component. <coughs> And then we got a 53 degree angle for the normal upright, so they're both positive. Cosine 53 and sine 53 times the 3.33 magnitude that comes from over there. And we get the normal acceleration expressed as a vector. It looks like I forgot the little vector hats on that thing right there and right there. They might be. I might have fixed it. No, I don't think I did, but those need vector hats. So. I guess they do on all of them, don't they? Okay, there we go. All right, so what I've done there, I've broken the normal and tangential into x and y components. Then to get the total acceleration of b, I just add them up. Okay, so there's the total acceleration of b. It's 0.32i plus 3.93j. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. All right, once you got it there, it's the same process as we did before because we've got three terms now, a sub a, a sub b, and the relative acceleration. You just throw it into a vector equation. And then you pull out the different components, one for the J and another for the I, okay? So that's really all there is to it from there. It's the exact same thing as we did before. You know, you can treat uh, 
acceleration as a vector just like you do velocity. So we can get a the acceleration of a with respect to bx and the acceleration a with respect to by. Square root of sum of the squares will get us the magnitude is 4.84. Do an arctan there and you'll get the angle 86.2 down and to the left. Okay. So that's the basics of the relative motion there. As I said, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail uh, in later in the class. And those of you that are mechanical engineers, you'll take Dynamics 2 in your junior year, and you'll get into even more detail on it. So it's something that they look at a little bit. Okay. All right, so that's kind of the beginning of the class here. It's just going through some of these. It's called kinematics, where we look at motion and try and describe it. Um, okay, so that's some things there. Now, let's have a look here at, we'll start to get into some of Newton's stuff here, F equals MA, if there aren't any, if there aren't any questions on this stuff. Are we, are we okay with that? No more questions? All right. But before we do that, let's look at friction here a little bit. This is, I'm skipping ahead just a page there to 290. Okay, now there's actually, uh, friction is a force that resists sliding is what it is. There's actually two types of friction. Um, dry friction, which is the surfaces are dry and you just got kind of a interference between the two surfaces and the irregularities in them. But there's also lubricated friction, which I don't know if you mechanical engineers will get into that or not, but that's kind of a mechanical thing, you know, where you actually lubricate like things in an engine or something like that. We'll look at uh, dry friction. Now what dry friction depends on is what's called the normal force on the object, which is kind of the force that pushes the two objects together. So the bigger the normal force, the higher the friction will be. So the force of friction is often said to be equal to, but in truth it's less than or equal to, a coefficient of friction called mu times that normal force. Okay. So what you want to do when you're figuring up friction is take the time to calculate the force of the surface on the object. In simple cases, it might equal just the weight of the object, but there's other cases where it may not. Okay. So in this first example here on the top of 290, um, what we've got going on there is, you know, it's pretty straightforward. I just go sum of Fy, set that equal to zero. Now I can do that because I don't have any acceleration in the y direction, so I can do statics in the y direction, set that equal to zero. And what I've got then is I've got 40 newtons down for the weight plus the normal force. And when I solve for the normal force, it's 40. Okay. Now, once I've got that, I can calculate the force of friction. That'll be the coefficient of friction, which is called mu. In this case, it's 0.25 times the normal force, which is 40. And that gets me 10 newtons. Okay. So if I look at the net force pushing this block to the right, I've got the 30 newton push that's shown but the friction is going to push back with 10. So the net is 20. So I got 20 newtons of net force pushing that thing to the right. Okay, so are we okay with that? We got any questions on that one? You might have run into this in physics. I wouldn't be surprised if you've had physics. Now, a couple of things on this. There's actually two different coefficients of friction. 
there's kinetic and static. Or, okay, static friction is what it takes to get something moving. Kinetic friction is something that is required to keep it moving. Generally speaking, it's hard to get something moving, to break it loose, than it is to keep it moving. So the coefficient of static friction is generally greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. Okay. And the other thing here is that friction is a reactive force only. It just reacts to the force that is trying to cause motion. So in this example here, the one at the bottom of the page, why don't you f just take a minute and find the force of friction. Find the normal force first and then find the force of friction. Shouldn't take too much on that. It's all pretty straight up. So what's the force of friction on that one? What's that? Ten. How about force of friction is, uh, you know, you, you calculate the mu Fn bit. So what do we got? 20? Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of possibilities out there, aren't there? Um, okay, now what mu Fn is? That's the maximum possible force of friction. That's as high as it can go. But if we look at this, see the force of friction reacts to what you're doing to the object. If all you're doing is pushing with 30, the force of friction isn't going to be 90, or excuse me, 40, because that's bigger than 30. If you look at that, that would actually move the block to the left, and that's not going to happen if you're pushing it to the right. So what the actual force of friction here is, isn't 40, it's 30, okay? It's just going to react to that and keep the block from moving. So keep that in mind, friction is a reactive force. It's, it's, it, doesn't, it isn't generated kind of on its own, it, it reacts to what you're trying to do to the object, okay? So we, we good with that? So the maximum possible force of friction is 40, but it would only be 30 in that case. Okay. okay let's have a look at one other. We got just a couple minutes here. This isn't in your book. I just made this one up. I guess this is actually in the statics book, if I remember right. <laughs> but I don't imagine you've got that with you. So you can just put it anywhere. So let's say we're going to, we got the weight of the block is 40 newtons. Mu is 0.3. Find the net force pushing the block up the incline. 
Okay, now on this kind of thing, I would use an inclined axis system. Because if I draw a full free body diagram of this thing, you know, I'll have the, the force pushing on the block, which is 60. I'll have the weight, and of course the weight acts straight up and down, and that's uh, 40, yeah, 40 newtons. Then I'm going to have the unknowns, which will be the normal force. And then I'll have the force of friction like that. Okay. Now with those two unknowns that both aligned at that 25 degree angle, I'm going to use an inclined axis system to get this figured out. Okay. That would be the way to go with this one. So, what do we got now? So, what we want to do is get everything aligned to that inclined axis system. There we go. So, what's that angle right there, do you suppose? It's 25, yeah. The other thing when you're doing these little sketches for geometry is it's also helpful to make them pretty close to scale. That way things will look kind of right. And, you know, if you're not doing it right, uh, you'll, you'll have a chance of seeing it, you know. Okay, so that's 25. How about the uh, other angle there with the vertical? I, I always like to use this angle right here. What's that angle, do you suppose? Uh, 25 again. Yeah, it's going to be 25. Um, what's going on here is we got a couple of right angles. That's a right angle right there. So 90 minus 25 gets you, what, 60? No, is it 50? No, it's 65 right there. And then you've got another right angle between the blues. So 90 minus 65 gets you back to 25. So there's our free body diagram, and of course we just love free body diagrams when we're figuring out these mechanics problems. They, you know, they're kind of important. Um, there you go. Okay, so now we take that free body diagram, and where I'm going with this is you want to take the time to find the normal force. The friction doesn't depend directly on the weight. It depends on the normal force. So if you've got that, you want to get that free body diagram drawn. Like so. And then do the uh, trig and such to get those forces figured out. So take the time to draw up the picture, get a free body diagram going, and to analyze it. Don't, don't shortcut the system. Okay, don't, don't get in too much of a hurry because you'll kind of pay the price for that. Okay, now the general rule on this stuff is find that normal first. Usually if you're moving up and down a ramp, the uh, sum of forces in the direction at 90 degrees to the ramp is zero because it, the, the object isn't accelerating normal to the ramp, it's accelerating along the ramp, parallel to it. So there you go, and then you just kind of look at that and go, okay, what do I got here? I've got minus sine 25 times 60 minus cosine 25 times 40 plus Fn. See, that's what you draw up first to solve for Fn, the normal force. So, you know, just take the time to look at it and analyze it and find that normal. Okay. So the normal is uh, 61.6, I think. So what we got there, 25 sine times 60. It's actually 25 point, well, about three or four, we'll call, just call it three. Okay, and then the force of friction is mu Fn, that's 18.5. 
And then when you go ahead and calculate the net force up the ramp, what you're going to have there is cosine 25 times 60. That's going up the ramp. But you've got to pick up that weight component going down the ramp. Sine 25 times 40. And then minus the friction. So that's the net force parallel to the ramp there, okay? So be sure you're picking up that weight component that's actually working it back down the ramp. Okay. All right, so when you start getting on inclines and things like that, these things can get a little bit trickier. Let's just say that. Two and three. Right, yeah. It's on its own page, maybe. Um, no, 151's on page seven. Let's see, 17, that's the 24th, I think. Good. I don't know. The, there's the last step on that. It's 19 newtons total going up the ramp.